Band of Brothers, Chapter 4, Brotherhood Memory Verse Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers. Nehemiah 4.14 Here we have a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. We must live together as brothers, or perish together as fools. Communion Week this week, when you guys get together in your platoons, you'll take communion together. Flip to the end of this chapter to read more about it. Don't skip out on this. True biblical brotherhood doesn't exist without the sacrifice paid by our first brother, Jesus Christ. Well, men, you're now into week number four of Band of Brothers. What are your thoughts so far? Have those disciplines you began in week one stuck? It's been said that if you do anything for 21 days straight, it will become a habit. So what do you think? Any new habits forming in your life yet? Good ones, I hope. Before you dive into this next chapter, take a moment and reflect on where you were three weeks ago. Do you see improvement in your life? Then say a quick prayer of thanks to Jesus and pray that he will continue to shape and mold your heart. If, as you look back, you don't see any change in your life, don't get discouraged. It takes us years to build up the walls around our hearts. Trust that Jesus is working to break them down, and pray that he will give you the strength to stay the course. This chapter is one of the most pivotal chapters in this study. Buy into it, and you will find not only a group of guys that will hold you accountable for a bunch of memory verses, and action steps, but you will also become part of a fellowship of true brothers for life, the kind of men that you can say, without doubt, from this day to the ending of this world, we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. This is a quote from Henry V from Shakespeare. Unity, brotherhood. For a lot of us men, especially those of us that are the Lone Ranger personality, that like to get everything done by ourselves, the idea of unity and true brotherhood is a foreign concept. Yeah, you may have a group of buddies that you watch the big game with, or go play poker together, or get drinks after work together, but is that really what unity is all about? Let's dig in, right at the start. Think back over the last three weeks. What were your toughest disciplines that you were struggling with in your life? On what battlefronts were you engaging the enemy? What were your biggest fears that you have been facing? You don't have to write them all down again. Just think back on all of it. Now, being completely honest with yourself on this first evolution, write down the names of three guys in your life that you could open up to with this tough stuff. Anytime, day or night, you could call them up and they would have your back. So here we have evolution one, called pick up the phone. Who are your top three? We're looking for you to write down the names of three men that have your back. It's harder than you thought, isn't it? It might be easy to come up with the names of two or three guys from work that you can hang out with and complain about your jobs or your spouses are your favorite teams, but when it comes down to the stuff that really matters, who can you turn to? Yet God's word is very clear on this point. A true man after God's heart will pursue real biblical brotherhood. Not as a nice little add-on to give him something to hang out with on the weekends, but as an absolutely essential part of his Christian walk. Take a look at the scriptures below and let the weight of what the Bible says about unity among brothers really set in. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 17.17 17. The hard times are coming, if you're not already in them. Who will you be able to lean on when those times come? You may have friends that love you, but who are your brothers? that were born to stand by your side in these moments. Without them, you will continue to fall back 
into your old sins as your crutch. Lean on one another. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Proverbs 27, 17. Over time, with use and neglect, every axe head will get dull. And once it's dull, it begins to lose its purpose. Who are the brothers in your life that will sharpen and challenge you to live the life you were called to live? Without them, you will lose your spiritual edge, and you will begin to chase things outside your true purpose. Sharpen one another. Lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Relationships are messy. We all make mistakes. We all make dumb choices. Who are the brothers that will make allowance for your faults and stand beside you, binding themselves to you, through the good and the bad. Without them you will quickly fall victim to the enemy's accusations, and you will be overcome by shame and guilt. Love one another. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Psalms 133 verse 1 You were not designed to go it alone. Who are the brothers that will stand in unity with you? Not to cheer for some sports team, but to stand for the one true cause that really matters, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be united with one another. The Hebrew word for live together in unity in Psalms 133 verse 1 is the word yachad. Literally, it can be translated when brethren are joined in dwelling or when brethren dwell together. In other words, when brothers do life together. Again, it is so much more than just meeting with a group of guys to shoot the breeze or talk about some Bible verses. It's about inviting each other into your homes, praying over each other, digging in, and doing battle together when a brother is hurting, celebrating with all that's inside of you when he succeeds. That is what brotherhood is all about. Can you see that brotherhood is important to God? In his wisdom, when he created each of us, he put inside of us different needs that could only be filled by others. There is the overarching need that he will put in all of us to have a relationship with him. Without that, you will have missed the point of life entirely and you will have spent your years on this earth in pursuit of a whole lot of things that won't be worth a dime when you're dead. But he also placed inside each of us a need for fellowship and community. You may be thinking that you can do life all on your own, that you've been successful up to this point. But the truth is, you're missing out. You've settled what you think is the good life because you honestly don't know any better. So this is the challenge for you. Open up. Drop your guard. Make the commitment before the men in your platoon this week that you are ready to make that change, that you're ready to do battle with the platoon of brothers at your side instead of charging off to fight the enemy all on your own. Men, there is something special that happens when you fight alongside your brothers. Those that have served in the military understand this. Even just going through boot camp together creates friendships that last a lifetime. But those relationships are forged with an unbreakable bond when they enter into the fires of battle together. Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore, commander of the 7th Cavalry in Vietnam, whose heroic leadership was made famous in the movie We Were Soldiers, wrote these words about the brotherhood that is found in war. We killed for each other, we died for each other, and we wept for each other. And in time, 
we came to love each other as brothers. In battle, our world shrank to the man on our left and the man on our right and the enemy all around us. We held each other's lives in our hands, and we learned to share our fears, our hopes, our dreams as readily as we shared what little else good came our way. He and his men understood what it meant to be brothers. They understood that in the thick of battle, they had to have men around them that would have their back, no matter what. In the movie about their sacrifice, there's a powerful scene where Colonel Moore is addressing the troops and their families before they were to head off to Vietnam. He talks about their unity that they have, despite all their differences, and he focuses on that. He tells them, We're moving into the valley of the shadow of death, where you will watch the back of the man next to you as you will watch his. And you won't care what color he is, or by what name he calls God. They say we're leaving home. We're going to what home was always meant to be. We are meant to be brothers. Or take this quote from the character Hoot, who, in the movie Black Hawk Down, went through hell and back to go deep into enemy territory to rescue his brothers that were in danger. When I get home, people will ask me, Hey, Hoot. Why do you do it, man? Why? You some kind of war junkie? You know what I'll say? I won't say a word. Why? They won't understand. They don't understand why we do it. They won't understand that it's about the men next to you. And that's it. That's all it is. These guys got it. There is a strength that is only found in the foxhole next to your brother. When you find those men that will be your true brothers, you will go through hell and back to fight for them, and they will do the same for you. As King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. There is a great picture in the Bible of what brotherhood looks like. Exodus chapter 17 verses 8 through 13 recounts one of the major battles the Israelites faced as they were on the road to the promised land. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Brehidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on each side, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. You may win a few battles on your own, but the war will only be won as we stand and fight together, lifting each other up when we grow weak, but always pressing forward together. So, let's go back a few pages. Take a look at the section where you were supposed to write down the names of three men in your life that you could truly call a brother. Did you write down any names? If so, after reading this chapter, do you still feel like those are the men that God has called you to do life with? What if you didn't write any names down? Are you willing to take the next steps? Are you willing to open up to your platoon and let them fill those spaces? What will it take for you to get to that place in your life? For the evolution below, write down at least two specific action steps that you will take this week to start being intentional about developing relationships with your brothers and share those steps with your platoon. Evolution 2. Action Steps. It's time to get real. 
In order for you to truly make changes in your life, you will have to step out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to pick up the phone, lay down your pride, and say, I can't do this alone. You're going to have to step into relationships that may be awkward at first and messy in the middle. But in the end, you will find those men that you can call brothers. Will you take the risk? So here we have a space for you to write down your two action steps. The sacrifice is worth it. Your brothers need you, and you need them. If you choose to hold out on them, either they will fail in their time of need, or it will be you that fails. What will your choice be? One last challenge. Go back to the story of Moses lifting his staff up in Exodus 17. Maybe as you wrap up this chapter, you find yourself in a good place. You've got your three already. Maybe you've even got more. So here's your challenge. Put yourself and those brothers into the story of Exodus 17. Then complete the evolution on the next page. Evolution 3. Don't get content. How can you be Joshua to your brothers? Sometimes in life we just get worn out when we need someone to jump in and lead the fight for us. Most of the time we're too prideful to admit that though. Take the initiative and ask your brothers, where are you struggling? Will you let me fight alongside you in this battle? This is more than just praying. This is getting in your car, driving to his house, and helping him get rid of all the alcohol in his house. This is grabbing your other brothers and some lawn mowers and going to his home to mow his yard because you know he's been in a crazy season of life. This is sacrificing your time and your presence. How can you be Moses to your brothers? We all need prayer warriors in our life. Someone who will lift up their staff and cover us in prayer. It's easy to say a prayer for a brother when he shoots out a text or email asking for it. A true brother is lifting up his friends every day, praying God's protection over them and their family, Play, praying God's strength and courage over them to stay in the fight, praying God's peace and faith over them as they lead in their homes and in their jobs. Are you lifting up your brothers in this way? How can you be Aaron and her to your brothers? What a boost it is to have men in our life that pour out encouragement over us. Not because of some trial we're going through or some project we just completed successfully, but just to strengthen us in our daily walks with Jesus. How can you be more of an encourager to your brothers in their lives. A few positive and uplifting words from a friend can mean all the difference to a brother that is in the midst of the daily grind. The quest stands upon the edge of a knife. Stray but a little and it will fail, but hope remains if friends stay true. This is a quote from the Lord of the Rings. A single twig breaks but the bundle of twigs is strong. This is a quote from Tecumseh. Next steps, communion. Brotherhood week is a great opportunity for you and your platoon to take communion together. This is one of the great traditions that has been a part of the church since day one. Don't worry about the logistics. Grab some grape juice and a loaf of bread. The what isn't what's important. It's the why that we celebrate together. Let's go back to the Old Testament and look at one of the most powerful displays of God's judgment and mercy as you prepare your heart for communion this week. At the end of the book of Genesis, we find the Hebrew people, once favored and welcomed by their host nation of Egypt, now enslaved under the rule of the new Pharaoh. In the following book, Exodus, the people have lost hope for their freedom. A Hebrew man named Moses, raised as a child in the Egyptian ruler's household, 
then exiled for murdering an Egyptian slave master, now has returned from his time in the wilderness with a vision from God and a mission to free the Hebrew people from slavery. In Exodus chapter 7, Moses and his brother Aaron began unleashing God's judgment upon the Egyptians, sending plague after plague on the entire nation in an effort to convince Pharaoh to let the Hebrews go free. The Bible says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened at each punishment, though, until the full measure of God's wrath and glory was displayed in one final plague. In the twelfth chapter of Exodus, the Bible says the Lord went through the entire nation of Egypt, sending his death angel before him, and killing the firstborn son of all the Egyptian families. As he was performing this awesome and terrifying work of judgment, he was also showing his mercy and grace upon the Hebrew people. For any one of the Hebrew families that killed a lamb and painted its blood on the doorpost of their homes, the angel would pass over their home, sparing their firstborn and sparing them from God's holy wrath. As they stayed hidden in their homes throughout the night, they ate a meal together that was very specifically described to the people by the Lord. This meal became known as the Passover meal to celebrate the night that God called his people out of slavery when he passed over their homes and set them apart. Now let's skip ahead to the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 26, we find Jesus and his disciples just hours before he was to be arrested, beaten, and tried before the Jewish council, reclining at a table, celebrating together that very same Passover meal. It was at this meal that Jesus shared with his men the very first communion service of the church. Matthew chapter 26 verses 26 through 28 tells us, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Just as hundreds of years earlier, God called his people out of slavery, and they commemorated that night by celebrating the Passover meal together. So you and I have been called out as well. God has called us out to be one people, unified under the banner of his son, Jesus Christ. As you take part in communion this week, our prayer is that you would realize that you are now part of a brotherhood of Christ, that you have been called out, set apart, to do life together in the service of your king, because of his blood that was shed and that his body that was torn. Celebrate and worship with your brothers and honor the life that was laid down so that you could be passed over and experience life and freedom in true brotherhood in the name of Jesus. Here we have an action step. Celebrate communion with your platoon this week. When we drink the cup of blessing, aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ? And isn't it the same with the loaf of bread we break and eat? Don't we take into ourselves the body, the very life of Christ? Because there is one loaf, our manyness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in Him. We don't reduce Christ to what we are. He raises us to what he is. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 through 17. And right, here we have some final notes on the chapter. Basically, mission objectives. Don't forget your memory verse. And be intentional about strengthening your platoon this week. 
Get together with one or more of your brothers for lunch or coffee. Do life together. There's also a section here for prayer request. And we have our memory verse again. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14.